Hello? Hello? Is my mic on? Oh, thanks for the follow, Ninja Boss 4. And I guess before I start, let me just shout out. Shout out. <laughs> I'm still nervous. <laughs> my new followers, um, Afro Squirrel, Floating Shoe, Kai Peru, Valpala, and Ninja Boss 4. Is my mic on? I think it's on. It's on, right? Yep, it's on. So, hi, Magindarang Araw. I'm Maya Maya Magindar. Yes, thank you for the cheers. I'm very, very nervous right now. It's what, like, it's the first time I've actually got this many people on a stream. But yes, hello, I'm Maya Maya Magindara. I'm a mermaid VTuber from the Philippines. And this is my first just chatting stream. And also something that I've actually wanted to do for a long time. I actually started vtubing because of philippine folklore so this is my philippine folklore story reading stream uh yeah i started vtubing because of philippine folklore i was just getting into vtubers like last december and then it was usually like hololive and niji sanji don't ask me who who's who i still can't tell who's who but i decided to check the philippine side of vtubing and there was like a lot of people who were making their vtuber personas based on philippine folklore and was like yes this this is my people i'm gonna join them at least it was kind of a joke in december like haha i'm gonna join them i started fooling around with vroid and then i got yeah you were a terrible influence val how dare you send me all those fun clips yeah but I wasn't serious until I got COVID and then VTubing became like this goal. Like when I get out of this sickness, I'm going to try this out for real. Yeah. Nope. Thanks. Thanks, Val. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I got here. So now this is the folklore storytelling stream that I've always wanted to start. So first things first, I, in my complete nervousness i was afraid that no one was gonna go here so i invited a few friends that i know in person over so for their sake here are some chat rules uh if you know me irl no you don't you don't you don't in case the people who know me in real life are here no you don't so chat away don't hold back be nice to everyone in chat make yourselves comfortable um I can't see you anyway, so I don't care if you're like watching in your underwear. I don't care. I don't, I'm trying not to imagine. I don't care. Uh, and number five, let me know if there's anything that I can do to make things better because um, audio quality has always been a weakness of mine. So if there's a problem there, just let me know, okay? So that's it for chat rules. They're kind of basic, aren't they? Just don't dox me, man is like the number one rule so first things first let's second thing that was the first thing let's acknowledge my sources for this stream woohoo i think i shared this on twitter one time all the folklore books that i've collected over the years our main source for now would be these four books the philippine folk literature books except for epics they were collected by this scholar named damiana eugenio she's been collecting this for a long long time and a lot of them were written academically they're also written in english that's why i'm doing the stream on in english because that's also my source material and then hmm, yeah i'm not using any other of these books right now for the stream the dictionary of philippine mythology if in case you want that it's mm, it's on pre-order on was it pre-order i think it's print to order from aswang project and then most of the others you can buy in up press in shopee and comic book stores the janus silang short i know the janus silang young adult novels you can buy at adarna house Yep, that's my sources for today. Do you guys want a refresher on what folklore is? Are we, like, do you want me to give the college exam refresher? 
yeah love it when someone cites their sources thank you thank you b uh as you can see some of these sources are kind of old they were a gift from my grandparents you can blame them for this i bl i would like to thank and blame my grandparents for where i am right now like one of these is from 1986 the pages are yellowed and i'm really really scared to open them so let's oh hi folk lover one thank you very much you love philippine mythology oh me too oh my god i'm looking at my viewer count i shouldn't look at it i'm gonna hide it so i stop being nervous hi everyone so <laughs> thanks grandparents yeah i'll send them your thanks on november 1 <laughs> uh -huh. so let's just get to the researchy part of this i actually tried i crammed as a very responsible student turned ouch i hit my mic a very responsible student turned vtuber well turned adult turned vtuber that i tried to cram the meaning of philippine folklore last night i read like a 50 or 20 to 40 page essay on what is philippine folklore and you know what i got no one has a clear definition on what is philippine folklore but according to the handbook of philippine folklore by meli liandico lopez there are four factors that are similar or make up philippine folklore so four basic qualities there we go first is repeated transmission so this is like the urumarites <laughs> type of story so people from the same group they tell this story over and over again to other people passing it along from generation to generation from your neighbors to the next next and this isn't solely oral tradition some of the stories are told in tapestries in dances in hmm, tapestries dances pottery there's a lot of ways that folklore is passed down right now we're concentrating on stories that were told orally that were eventually written down and then another quality of philippine folklore is multiple existence so uh, a folklore item must have more than one occurrence in place or time before it can be called folklore so there's that's why there's a lot of versions an example of a folklore that has a lot of version is cinderella there's a lot of places that have the cinderella story it's not just the french one that's more popular that we know today they always have the same element like there will always be this girl who lost her parents eventually got adopted by her step siblings who are stepmother step siblings who are evil and she's banned from meeting with the prince but every place with a cinderella story there's actually a cinderella story from africa there's one in asia there's one in europe it's it's like universal they all share that start of the story but not everything has a fairy godmother uh there are some where the thing that helps cinderella out is a tree there's another where it's a bird it depends but they're all kind of the same story and that's kind of what it means for a story to have multiple existence the third quality of philippine folklore is the loss of identity of author or creator so for example that cinderella story no one knows who like came up with it first so it's counted as folklore but the cinderella story that was authored by charles perot which we most of us know today that's not folklore anymore because that one had an author and then the last quality of philippine folklore would be stability and change again like the cinderella story there's always this stable set of elements that make up a cinderella story but there's also changes like the changes aren't usually people who deliberately like oh i want this to happen i want that to happen sometimes different places have different changes and that's what it means when a story has different is both stable and changing so those are the four qualities of philippine folklore that uh i guess to put us all on the same page on what folklore is 
or isn't? Hi, Moonbule Tree. Hello, Moonbule. Welcome to the stream. Hello. Hold on. Hold on. So let me just take a drink of water and then I want to start with a story that I selected and then later chat I have like around four stories that you can choose from. So I'm going to leave the rest of the stories to you but let me just take a drink of water and then I'll start with the first story. I just want to shatter everyone's like preconceived notions of folklore being fantastic and having a like good ending. So we're going to start with Hermogenes and One. It's not that popular, but when you listen to it, it feels very Filipino and it's, uh, how do I say this? It's very bullshitty in a very Filipino way. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh god, this book is old. It's so yellow, I'm so scared of it. <clears throat> okay, so for our first tale, it's called Hermogenes and Juan. It's a folk tale from Bicol, from Bicol region. And it's about two brothers, Hermogenes, who is he is the responsible one. He's the one who has a job. And then there's Juan. Juan is very Juan. Juan is a quintessential character in Philippine folklore. He's sometimes he's very smart. Sometimes he's very dumb. Sometimes he's just sometimes he's just a dumbass. So I'll leave it up to you to figure out which which one Juan is. <laughs> There's so many ones. Which one one is for this for this story? Okay? <clears throat> Let me just start. There was two brothers, Hermogenes and Juan. They had yeah, sometimes he's just one. That's true. Two brothers, Hermogenes and Juan. They have an old bedridden mother who has not been given a bath for so many days. One day, Hermogenes, before going to work. He told Juan to give their mother a bath. Remember to use warm water in bathing Inai, for she cannot stand cold water, said Hermogenes. Now Juan, being Juan, he got their big cauldron. He started boiling some water. And when it was boiling, Juan lifted his mother and placed her in the cauldron. Yeah, the cauldron with boiling water. Instantly, at least according to the text that I'm reading, instantly their mother died. What a great start. Dead mothers right off the bat. Hermogenes, when he came back, he asked. <laughs> yeah, when he came back, has Inai taken her bat yet? And Juan answered, yeah. She even enjoyed her bat. She was wriggling wildly as I placed her in the cauldron. Sure, Juan, sure. Did you place her there, Juan? Asked Hermogenes as he ran to the kitchen and found their mother, you know, boiled to death. Yeah, Juan. <laughs> Juan, Juan! Ina is dead! Ina is dead! Why did you place her inside the cauldron? I'm going to leave you here. I'm going to I'm going away, said Hermogenes. So Hermogenes packed his bags and left the house with Juan and the dead mother. But Juan did not want to get left behind. He tore out the door, carried it on his back, and he followed his brother. On the way, he saw a turtle and picked it up because why not? Hermogenes, for all of his, you know, speech about leaving his brother, let him follow him around until they reached a forest and they decided to rest 
on top of a tall tree. By night time, a group of bandits made it to the encampment, uh, made it, made camp at the foot of the tree where the brothers were staying. Then they began eating food that consisted of roasted pig and other delicious things. One, being Juan, wanted to climb down and join them. Don't do that, Juan. They will kill you, said Hermogenes, who has their one brain cell. So what did Juan do? Juan, <laughs> he opened his fly, pulled down his pants, and decided to pee on the chief of the bandits from up high on the tree. Yeah, Juan decided to pee on the bandits. Now, the chief of the bandits, because he's not very smart, thought that it was raining. <laughs> yeah, Hermogenes has the one brain cell in this entire story. So the chief of the bandits, who was getting peed on, thought it was raining. And then Juan dropped the door that he was carrying this entire time, their house door. From their house to up this tree, he dropped the door, which made a terrible noise as it broke the branches of the tree. The world is coming to an end, cried the bandits as they scampered away. It's certainly due to our evil, evil ways. Team Bandit is blasting off again. They left behind their food, their piss-covered food. When they saw this, the two brothers climbed down the tree and ate all the food of the bandits. Then they left the place for... They were afraid that the bandits might return. Also, the place is covered with pee now, so please don't stay there, Hermogenes and Juan. Now, their adventure does not end here. Because remember, Juan picked up a turtle and that turtle has to find its purpose somehow. So, while walking, the two of them met a giant who threatened to eat them. Ho 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 ho! This is your end, little people. Now I will eat you. Juan, because he's one, decided to challenge the giant. There's no reason. I'm sorry to disappoint you, flirters. Juan boiled his mom for no apparent reason. He's just one. We don't question one. So anyway, Juan right now, he is fighting the giant. Juan said, we are bigger than you. To prove he who is bigger, show us your lice. Lice as in kuto, garapata. Juan challenged the giant to show us his lice. <laughs> so the giant, who doesn't seem to have a brain cell, got one of his lice the size of a man's fist and gave it to Juan. Oh God. It's a giant kuto. What the fuck? Is this all? It's too small. Get another, said Juan. So the giant picked up one more louse and showed it to Juan. This time it was, let's say, it's big as two fists. Again, Juan was not contented. The giant had a lot of lice on his hair, apparently. So he ended up giving Juan five lice and Juan spoke. Nah. We really are bigger than you. And then Juan got his turtle, one that's kind of, let's say the turtle is as big as a boulder, and gave it to the giant. This is a young louse. It's not its final form. It's going to grow bigger, okay? So the giant saw this. Oh my God, that's a really, really big louse, even if it's, you know, a turtle. And he was terrified. And so he ran away. And... That's the end of this tale. Yeah, that's how it ends. Hermogenes and Juan, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls and nine... And what? How did it go again? Bitches and bros and nine binary hoes. That is the story of Hermogenes and Juan. A tale from Bicol. A tale about a dude named Juan being very, very Juan. Yay! Did you like that chat? Did you like the first tale? Wasn't it awesome? Wasn't it very Filipino? 
<laughs> it sounds like Babalu and Dolphy. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm currently watching this before sleeping and despite the mom death, the pee and the giant, I do feel very cozy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Th thanks a lot. <laughs> Juan is dumber than a shonen pro tag. Is he? he? You could also say that he's kind of smart. Or is that? Is it just me? We can make this story sinister if we wanted to. Juan is the original shonen pro tag. <laughs> okay, I mean... Sure, sure. Juan can be anyone you want him to be. That's the nature of Juan's in folklore. Juan is unconventionally smart somehow, right? Right? Well, except for peeing on the... I guess he was just... Or maybe he's lucky. Everyone's kind of dumber than him. So that's our first story. I have around five lined up. Yeah, his logic is roundabout, but it made sense <laughs> somehow. It made sense. I can't believe we had to boil his mom for this adventure to start. Yeah, yeah. Somehow, sometimes, folklore just starts in very, very weird places. So, chat, I'm gonna send five story choices for you to pick for the next story. Let me just type it in. So, our choices are girl bo Gaslight Girl Boss Aswangs. Twink vs. Sexy Snake, How Evil Gave Men Fire, or A Mountain of Parental Abandonment. Please choose the next story while I take a drink of water and not Tinolang Nanay. Tinolang Nanay ang pot. Okay, so we have two picks for Gaslight Girl. Okay, Gaslight Girl Boss Aswangs it is. Let me just pick the right book. Gaslight Girl Boss Aswangs is... You know how you normally think of Aswangs as... So everyone's... Hi, Ninja Boss. Welcome to the chat. Everyone's up for Gaslight Girl Boss Aswangs. This is a story from Capis in Visayas where aswangs are popular, but this is not about aswangs that chop their body in half. Body parts do still fly away, but no one gets chopped in half. Are you disappointed now that this is the story you picked? No one gets chopped in half. Okay, it's kind of short. <clears throat> Once there lived a widow with six pretty daughters. The mother gave feast after feast. Mm -hmm. The mother gave feast after feast to draw suitable suitors for her daughters. Attracted by the dazzling beauty of the girls, rich young men came to their house. They were lavishly entertained and invariably they fell madly in love with the girls. But since the widow's house was in an isolated place near the mountains, they always asked the guests to stay stay for the night. You know, always a safe thing. Stay for the night at the house of the women in Capis. Sure, super safe. Where there's a swang, super safe. The house was large and comfortable. Overnight, guests were given a room, each with his own key. In the mornings, however, the guests found themselves robbed of their jewels and gold. Nobody could explain how this happened since the rooms were securely locked and like women, women steal gold and money? <gasps> Scandalous. Rumors began to get around that the widow and her daughters were witches and year after year, the girls remained unmarried. <gasps> In this day and age, unmarried women, oh my god, scandalous. In a neighboring town lived six brothers, you know, to match the six pretty daughters. Their parents died, leaving them a considerable fortune, 
which allow them to live comfortably without working. Sana all putang ina. Bakit ako naingit in the middle of reading a story? <clears throat> allow them to live comfortably without working. Only the youngest was hardworking and adventurous. He wanted to look into the mysterious goings on in the widow's house. Diba? Sana all. So he convinced his elder brothers to go with him to pay to court the pretty daughters. Hashtag sana all. They were entertained most warmly and the brothers agreed that there were no girls more charming than their hostesses. When it was time to retire, the youngest one warned his brothers to be on alert for his signal. He intended to keep watch to find out what happens at night during this in this house. The moon was at its fullest and outside it was almost as light as day. As the youngest brother lay in his room, keeping his ears and eyes wide open, he heard some strange stirrings in the quarter next to his. He peered out of his window and saw some blackbirds flying away from the house. He alerted his brothers and I thought the doors was, were locked. Oh well. And they all looked out for their, of their window and they saw six black birds silhouetted against the moonlight and flying in the direction of the nearest mountain. Hmm, six brothers, six sisters, six birds. Who can this be? He told them of the strange sounds and together they forced open the room where he had heard them come. Wow. <clears throat> green-minded. The brothers stood as if petrified. On six beds lay six headless corpses, one to each bed, so six headless women per bed. That's nice. That's super convenient, right? Recovering from shock, the youngest one dashed to the kitchen to get ashes. He heard stories about witches, and thinking they were dealing with these creatures, he would use the only known antidote against them, ashes. He sprinkled the, this on their severed necks. Then the six blackbirds flew through the window and alighted on each headless corpse. The birds tried to reunite with the corpses through the gaping neck hole, but the ashes prevented them from doing so. They broke into an eerie chorus of wails and laments. They reviled the brothers whose presence they had discovered by then. They vowed the most horrible vengeance on them. The youngest brother was undaunted. After all, he's kinda... He has plot har armor, the youngest brother. He accused them of masquerading as pretty women, the better to attract attract rich suitors whom they could rob which isn't a crime dude i'm sorry leaving behind the house where out of this world cries continue to pierce the night the brothers went to the mountain and they from which they seen the blackbirds come and they came upon a horde of gold and jewels surely the loot of the witches from their earthly suitors they earned this fair and square bros how dare you let them keep their money. I'm sorry, I'm biased. I'm pro-witch in this story. The brothers hauled the riches to town and gave them back to their owners. Boo! The irate people organized a group that swooped down on the witch's house and burned it. They heard again the eerie wails. The witches could not reunite with their corporeal bodies and neither could they escape. Because of the ashes, they all burned to death. And from then on, Capis was free from these evil, evil manananggal. Or so you think. Witches who could sever their heads from their bodies. Their heads flew about at night as blackbirds, preying on hapless victims. The end. It's unfair, right? Right? Like, oh my god, I kept the story title as Hermogenes as one and one. I... I wanted to change the story to photo to this one. <laughs> ah, I'm so sorry. So, yeah. It's unfair, right? I mean, the witches were just trying to make money. 
the best way they know how. It's not illegal. Gaslight gatekeep girl boss. That's right. Let me just see. So many things from Philippine mythology would make awesome visuals in TV or movies. That's right. That's right. I think one of the problems we have right now every time we try to adopt Philippine folklore is less the lack of stories to adopt, more, mm, I guess, more lack of budget, I would say, and like respect, I guess, for creators here in the Philippines. Probably why Trese had to be animated by a Korean team and funded by Netflix. Right? It's just show business. Everyone needs to earn a living. That's... Mm, let me just stretch. Ah. That's the story of Gaslight Girl Boss Aswangs. Maybe someday someone will write a story that where the Aswangs get, you know, their justice. It's kind of unfair. It's not like they were eating anyone. They were just stealing their money. Okay, that's a crime. But, you know, okay, sometimes you gotta eat people. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Speaking of eating people, this is just a side note. Something that I learned from my grandfather. If you're going to eat, <laughs> sometimes you gotta eat people. Yeah, sometimes you eat people without knowing it. This is the, like, a side trivia from my grandfather who believes that aswangs exist and they do and they do if you're going to eat something from let's say kapi sikihor those areas where aswang stories are popular the first thing that you should do if you're served meat is to uh, squeeze some calamansi juice on the meat apparently aswangs don't like that and it breaks their spell so let's say you were served some dubious pansit questionable pancit and it has a lot of meat if you put some calamansi juice on the meat it will revert back to its original form if it was human meat so suddenly you have like an eyeball on your plate an arm a finger but hey yeah that's how you find out if you were being served human meat meat lovers pancit <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, imagine like eating pancit, you put some calamansi on it and suddenly fingers, yay! If you get that, please give it to me. As a Magindar VTuber, I very much like human meat, so vegans are immune to aswang trickery. I don't know, maybe someday aswangs will figure out how to make fake tofu. <laughs> Wouldn't that be like the most evil thing an aswang can do to vegan to a vegan? Like here is some veggie tofu, a veggie meat, and then you put like you're eating it. It's delicious. Mmm, this veggie meat is so good. And then you put calamansi on it, and suddenly you were eating human all along. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, for our next story, I tried consolidating a bunch of Igorot folk tales that were had the same story themes. Want another evil laugh? <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> that that wasn't the practice. That was just my laugh. Um, for our next story, it's. Mm, a, I tried consolidating a bunch of Igorot folk tales into one story. Oh, okay, Bumblebee, thanks for watching and. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. I'm still very, very nervous, but your words make me feel better. Have a good night and try not to dream of aswangs <laughs> for. Or do, if you're into aswangs, why not? In my imagination, they're very hot and sexy. And, you know, girl bossy, so... For our next tale, um, again, I tried to consolidate a lot of Igorot folk tales. So this isn't the Igorot folk tale per se. It's more of an adaptation. So let me just remember to change my background this time. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's one goes, ah, I'm gonna eat you. Mm -hmm. And Bumblebee's just there like, go on, I'm ready. How do you want me to lie down, ma'am? Right? If they're hot, why not? Let me just change the story title for real this time. Mm -hmm. I didn't... Hello... Oh, you didn't know about the calamansi trick? It's just something that my grandfather told me. He might have, you know, he might have made it up, Hikari Tala. My grandfather's kind of a liar that way. So our next story is an adaptation of Igorot folktales called The Star Weaver. The Star Weaver, or rather Star Maidens, they're always a popular character in Igorot folktales. Mm, I think if you watch a lot of anime, you'll find some similarities to like Japanese, Chinese, and Korean stories with this one. But again, a disclaimer, this is not the original Igorot folktale. This is a retelling that I made. So is it an original short story? Maybe. I haven't figured it out yet. <clears throat> so let's go the star weaver once upon a time when the world was still young in the mountains of what is now known as the igorot province there was a strong and kind farmer who lived alone with his prized carabao he was quite skilled in everything that he did not because he's naturally talented but because he worked hard his crops were always the fattest and most delicious in their village but this story isn't about him thousands of tales have been told about him this is about the star weaver who descended from the heavens to learn more about humankind so let's start again there was once this star weaver one of the many daughters of the sky god who, like her sisters, was tasked to deliver blessings to the humans below. The tapestries that they weave dictate the state of the skies above, whether it's rain or shine, or the dark blanket of night. Igrot ancient aliens, mm, maybe? But they and the humans must never meet. The humans will rely on them too much if they know about their existence, their father warned. But this particular star weaver, she was getting bored of her heavenly home. She yearned for the color and excitement and the chance to create more than just the weaves that were passed down to her by her predecessors. Because, you know, the sky can be quite colorful. It can be blue or orange, purple, black, gray. This is true, but the sky is also often monochromatic. The same cannot be said about the human world, where blossoms of pink and yellow dot the green plains, the blue river cuts the gray rocks and tan valley in twain, and humans, they weave cloths that mixes reds with yellows and blacks and whites. The birds who can freely cross the realm of man and celestial, they often speak to this star, star weaver about the seasons and festivals, of heroes and villains, love and loss, of not just responsibilities of which she had many, but of freedoms. The weaver was determined. She will descend to the human world. Oh, okay, flirter, so you side with the dad here? Humans cannot be trust trusted with convenience. I mean, true, true. So one day, Using wings that she wove in secret, the star weaver flew down. But she wasn't completely able to escape her father's limited omnipotence. Because as soon as his father realized that her daughter, his daughter has disappeared on him, he let thunder and lightning fall from the sky. And all that did was clip the weaver's wings and send her crashing down a river. 
That is when she meets him. The farmer was letting his carabao cool itself down in the river after a hard day's work. He was also about to fall asleep when he heard a loud splash. Pre overreaction watch? I mean, <laughs> it's a god, they do this a lot. <laughs> they are very emotional for, you know, for being all powerful beings. Now, this weaver, she thought that she must have looked so silly to this farmer. Her skin was very pale, her hair was very dark. It's almost as if she was a frail creature of black and white who would evaporate into ether at the slightest touch. Nevertheless, the farmer ran to her. He removed his vest, oh my god, those muscles, and handed it to her along with his blanket. Get changed quickly, you might get sick. She does what she's told, trades her white dress for her borrowed clothes of reds and blacks and whites and golds. And she looks at her reflection on the water, mesmerized. It's as if the color of his clothes seeped into her skin. Look at me! Look at me! I'm just like you now! I'm just like you! He smiles at her, but wirely eyes the wings that she had discarded behind her. Without a thought, she kicks the wings and lets the current take them. Goodbye, wings. Goodbye. I'm just like you now, she repeats. And his smile grows brighter. He nods, just as surely as she was resolute, and offers his hand for her to hold. You are one of us now. Welcome. Let me take you to our village. Yep, let it go. <laughs> it takes a while, but she eventually gets used to the everyday life of being a human. The villagers learn to accept her as their own. She can read the weather better than anyone. She learned to weave with many colors, and in turn she taught the villagers how to weave blessings into their cloth. She listened intently as the farmer told her about the plants and the seasons, how her and her father's seemingly mundane acts in the celestial realm could influence his entire livelihood. And he didn't get mad when she confessed to him that one time she was feeling kind of emotional and she may have ruined an exceptionally good harvest for him when she was still up there in the celestial realm. And the farmer, he has never asked her to hold back on her emotions and opinions. So, the star weaver fell in love with the human world. She fell in love with him. When he asked her to marry him, she immediately said yes. A child was soon born, born to them. They looked just like their father, but had all of their mother's boundless energy and curiosity. Imagine that on a two-year-old. What the hell? When they were old enough to explore on their own, they would sometimes bring home items from their adventures. Shiny rocks, a snack from the village grandma, herbs. And then one day, Mother, look what I found! One day, the child brought home a pair of muddy wings from the riverbank and I guess I'm gonna end that story right there let's move on to another story and then I'll continue this next time I mean after a few stories as is tradition with folklore let's end with a cliffhanger on the star weaver is that everyone all right with that or do you want me to continue the story why do you hurt me so? I'm, I'm sorry. We could continue if you want. We could also like choose from the other stories that weren't chosen earlier. We have... What's the gender of the children? I did not pick. <laughs> it's irrelevant. That's why I tried for the gender neutral pronoun. Okay, uh, let's select the next story and we'll put a pin on the star weaver for later. Uh-huh. Our choices are 
Twink vs. Sexy Snake, How Evil Gave Men Fire, or How a Mountain Was Born Out of Parental Abandonment. Uh, is one boiling the star weaver? No, one's not coming back. Were you traumatized by one? One's not coming back for now. Give the twink. Twink versus sexy snake. Okay, hold on. Let me just go back to... Twink versus sexy snake? Is that the choice? Are you sure you don't want how evil gave men fire or parental abandonment? The story ended with Juan boiling the Star Weaver. Why? Should I change everything? Should I change the entire story? Suddenly, Juan came back and killed everyone with boiling water and piss. Mm hmm. So our next story is the snake enchantress. So let me just let me just put some visuals. You guys play Shin Megami Tensei. It has a very, very sexy snake lady in it. Oops, I covered myself. MC Actually I was thinking because somehow all of the stories that I ended up liking was from the Pico region, coincidentally. I was thinking of like trying to piece together the Be Call Folklore universe because there's a lot. Whoever Damiana Eugenio, the the person who archived all these short stories, interviewed from Be Call, that person was a very interesting storyteller because all of the Be Call myths that I've come across are super interesting. One is the strongest adventure. Coincidentally, one is also from Be Call in this tale. Maybe. One is like, who is the strongest Avenger? Hawkeye. No? Is it Hawkeye? Let me just drink water. One's mom is really the Star Weaver. Wow, no. The Star Weaver story is from. From Igorot, it might have been a very, very big trip for her to go to Beacon. So just let, can we start with the next story? Are you okay with that? I have the sexy snake lady for inspiration. Sexy Shin Megami Tensei snake lady. Okay, so our next story is from Bicol. Again, Bicol stories are super interesting to me. One is indeed the Philippines' very own Florida man. That is true and that is accurate, Ninja Boss. So, there was once a fabulous snake in Tiwi Albay, reputed to have lured many men into destruction. When she wanted a victim, she would change herself to a beautiful woman. She was the daughter of the evil god. Asuang, and her name was either Irago or Oriol. Her abode, people believed, was under the Higabo or the Tiwi Hot Springs. During moonlit nights, she would be seen by passersby sporting among the boiling waters. Must be very cinematic, just one sexy lady and all that steam. Mm. Those who had seen her without falling for her charms could attest to the fact that at that time, Irago was very captivating and would add that if they did not flee, they themselves would have been bewitched to death too. What a wonderful way to die. Her powers were reported by men whose companions perished under her enchantment. The people could of course not believe such an incredible tale. They believed that Asuang did not have any connection with Irago, this sexy, sexy snake lady. Hello, Hikikomori Sara. Welcome to the stream. We've just started the tale of the snake enchantress. She is 
a very very sexy snake lady who lives in the hot springs of Tiwi Albay and she is incidentally the daughter of the god of evil who is named Asuang and she seduces men yeah she's bringing sexy back okay let's bring the sexy story back so Irago, her mode of enchanting men was very simple because honestly how hard could it be she would simply make herself very irresistible until the singled out man became so madly in love with her that he had no alternative but to jump after her and consequently as he plunged into hot waters he got boiled before any help could arrive just like Juan's mom apparently this is connected <laughs> but it was even said that the victim would rather die than be saved because why would you want to be saved she's a sexy snake lady man right that's hot literally hot as the man died irago would change herself back to the form of a snake take his soul out of him to deliver to her father the god of evil asuang then when she was ready to take the next man she would change herself again to a beautiful woman this went on for some time as and eventually eventually because interference is always late the police are always late in shows in crime shows so eventually the people of the town decided to intervene the men especially the young men were growing fewer and fewer and won't someone think of the men they discussed means of getting rid of the enchantress and subsequently they issued notices that no one should go to the higabo or else they'll get punished but in spite of this you know she's a sexy snake lady men still went it went to visit men still died because mm, yeah willing to get hot for the snake see that's right it's worth it worth it so the people they prayed to gugurang the god of good to deliver them from such a scourge and gugurang being you know kind of the government in this tale told the people to sacrifice to him and after that perform an exorcism against aswang so the priestesses known as balienas they were summoned to make preparations a shelter of palms known as the Gulang Gulangan Den was built, and that served as the temple. What they sacrificed, we don't know. Human flesh, probably, you know. It's always human flesh. Uh, it's spelled uh, B-A-L-I-E-N-A-S. Balienas, probably. Wait, let me just type it out because yeah, I found it weird too. There we go. So what they sacrificed, we don't know. But it was the best that they could offer to their highest deity. After that, in another place, they performed an exorcism using betel nut leaves. All finished, they expected the power of Irago to be totally annihilated. But even then, they continued to hear again of men lured to the boiling stream. Because again, hot snake lady. Sexy. Worth it then here's the hero of our story one day or you know the anti-hero if you're super into the snake lady amidst depressed spirits arrived a youth he announced that he had come to battle with the enchantress and to deliver the people from her whether they like it or not she's really really sexy he was too young and he was asked by the elders not to risk his young life and the young women especially and treated him for their own sake because this youth he was very very pretty and very very young and again in my imagination he's kind of a twink this is twink versus snake enchantress that's the sexy snake that's the unofficial title of this story so this young hero young beautiful hero he could not be daunted he asked the people asked what his name was he never gave them an answer. On a chosen night, when the moon was high in the sky, this twink went to kill Irago. 
he was dressed in a charmed palm with charmed palm leaves, which was believed to immunize the wearer from injuries. Sexy snack boil boiled twink. No, we're not gonna boil the twink. Maybe. I forgot how this story ends actually. Uh-huh. In one of his inner pockets, he carried a magic stone, a round one, which he had obtained on his way. On the third night after the full moon, he watched under the puso ng saging or the banana blossom. And at eight o'clock, a stone fell from that blossom. He picked it up and a giant, again a giant, appeared to snatch it from him. They fought and he vanquished him. Oh my God, is the hero really one? And thus he got possession of the magic stone. The stone had the power to make him invincible. He also carried a spear and a sword. Thus equipped with his spear, his sword, his magic stone of invincibility, he battled with the snake enchantress. Three days and three nights they fought. Irago tried to enchant him, but she was powerless to use this weapon. Maybe our hero just isn't into sexy snake ladies? Who knows? She was to be beginning to fail herself. She called on to her father, Asuang. Asuang answered. With an art all his own, he caused the youth's palm clothes to burn. Oh no, now it's a naked battle. <clears throat> oh no. Am I gonna get demonetized for this? There's a naked little boy. No, there's a naked youth fighting a sexy snake lady in the hot springs and this is folklore i don't i didn't write this by the way for a while the youth writhed in agony the snake bit him but because of the stone he was carrying she could not cause any wound they fought until the seventh day on the seventh day the youth finally succeeded in finding an opening in the scales of the wily snake with, when his sword cut a big wound she lay moaning and breathing fire. She again called to her father, who readily responded. Yeah, an entire week. They fought for an entire week. The boy was naked and the snake is still sexy. As Wang sent a spirit to snatch the stone from the youth. Invisible to him, the evil spirit stole the magic stone, which when, when he felt gone, his courage began to fail him. Wow, so he ran out of stone and now he's not brave. Okay, sure. Seeing this advantage, Irago, lying on her deathbed, rallied and succeeded in sending the youth sprawling into the hot water. The onlookers rushed to save him, but it was too late. Another person was boiled to death in this dream. But just as he died, Irago expired too. The delivered people were sorrowful to see their hero die. They took the body of the youth and buried it with proper ceremonies amidst the crying of the whole people. And that's the end of the story of the snake enchantress versus the naked youth. A week-long battle, there was a magic stone, and the sexy snake lady is a sexy snake lady. Yeah, sexy snake, wild twink, worth it. An entire week of naked fighting. Oh, thanks for the follow, Hikikomori Sara. I just saw it right now. Magic stop. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe. We don't know. It's a valid interpretation. So that's how many stories have we had? We've had Hermogenes and Juan. We've had gaslight girl boss as wongs we have twink versus sexy enchantress we have part one of the star weaver yeah we've had four well three and a half star weaver isn't finished yet so what okay so these are our choices for the next story we have evil gives man Evil Gives Man Fire is kind of connected to this story in a way that it's about the snake lady's dad. It's about Asuang. Or we can have parental abandonment. 
or we can have the continuation of star weaver yep so those are our choices parental abandonment we have one boy vote for parental abandonment one vote for fire oh okay have fun flirters thank you very much for tuning in this video would probably still be here later if you want to catch up so we have two votes for a fire oh thank you very much too thank you thank you you have no idea how much your presence helps me right now oh no my stone is gone i'm losing courage ah <clears throat> so we have two votes for a fire one vote for parental abandonment so how about it story about fire let me change let me remember to change this time mm -hmm. Snack lady. Ooh, what was my photo for this? Mm -hmm. And what was my book for this? Hold on. I have three to four books right next to me today. My cat caught a lizard and it's murdering it. <laughs> no, um, I mean, cat's got a cat, right? Maybe it's his new friend. Lizard friend. Oh, this story is kind of long. Or maybe the pages of this story is, of this book is just a little smaller. Dead friend. <laughs> Dead lizard friend so uh this is connected kind of to our previous story about the sexy snake lady because uh if you remember asuwang was the snake lady's dad and gugurang is the god of good that the people sacrificed to for them to get rid of the snake lady did gugurang help who knows But just let me know when I can start. And I'm going to drink water while we haven't started yet. <clears throat> ah, stretch. Whew. I just want to thank everyone that's here. My family. God, Jesus, Jesus. All right. Ended up checking Twitter. <laughs> Can I start? Is it okay? I'm going to start. So our next tale is... It's a little similar to the Prometheus myth of Greek mythology. In which someone steals fire for someone else. And that's... You know, that's how humans get fire. Because someone stole it from someone. So Asuang steals fire from Gugurang is another Bicol myth, Bicol legend. And someday we're gonna piece together the Bicol cinematic universe. Aliens. Long ago, when the world was still young, and good and evil gods were not yet enemies as they are now, they were still friends each living in a separate mountain in Bicol. Some would even say that the god of good, Gugurang, and the god of evil, Aswang, were brothers. Gugurang lived inside Mount Mayon, meanwhile Aswang lived in Mount Malinao. As gods, they had control of the welfare of the people. But Gugurang was more powerful than Aswang, who was merely a subordinate. The former was the chief deity of the Bicols. Gugurang was the chief deity. Now, Gugurang was given full control of the people who looked up to him for protection and for advancement. Whenever the people disobeyed his orders or wishes, he would cause the pit of the Mayon volcano to rumble terribly. This is a 
This story is poorly timed. If you live near Taal, please take care of yourselves. The people in time took this as a sign or warning and accordingly mended their evil ways. Or, if their sins was for beyond forgiveness, Gukurang would just make the volcano erupt and wipe out all the sinners. Problem solved. Gugurang then became the symbol of good, ready to punish the bad. When the people saw fire flowing from the crater of Mount Mayon, they would grow afraid. They would offer a sacrifice to him to appease his wrath. The Balyana, again the priestesses, officiated the ceremony. Always when they committed wrong, there would be loud moaning of the earth. <laughs> followed by an eruption of fire and lava. Now, Asuang was different. He had no fire in his abode inside Mount Malinaw. He wanted to be as powerful as Gugurang, at least. If the people aroused his rat, he would sub subdue them by fire or rumbling in Mount Malinaw. So, he went to Gugurang and asked him to give him some fire. But, Gugurang refused, and mm, by the way, I'm gonna make some voices, so if my stream audio scoffs, please let me know. <clears throat> How dare you ask for my fire, Gugurang thundered. The earth trembled. Don't you know that when the fire in my seat is carried by filthy hands such as yours, the whole world will be set on fire? But I will be very careful, replied Aswang. <laughs> be careful. I myself with all my power cannot handle it. But then, how can you threaten people with it? It is not my will who does it. It is someone else's. That you or I do not know, nor will ever be known, said Gugurang. Yeah, washing hands remain relevant, right? Just like in real life. But the rainy days are coming, and I need fire to make me warm in Mount Malinaw, said Aswang. Why? If you lived for there for many years, why is this the first time that you are asking me for fire? What will you use it for? Look at your people, they can live without it. Well... It's time to give them fire now. And Gugurang, you know, who is, again, a reminder, he is the supposed god of good, said this. Give them fire? <laughs> the earth shook and the people were more afraid. But soon Gugurang quelled the commotion. Asuang himself was frightened. He never saw his brother that way before. They are not fit to have it yet. They must make themselves more worthy. Well, brother, said Aswang, am I not worthy of fire? You? Worthy? You lazy god, look at your ragged mountain and compare it to my own, the most beautiful mountain in all of the world. Aswang argued with his brother for a long time, but Gugurang would not Budge an inch. Asuang then discovered, before he had not, that Gugurang was all powerful, all powerful and refusing to give people even a smidge of fire. So Asuang narrowed his eyes and smiled with sinister import. He decided to oppose his brother from now on. You want to be the omnipotent power? Asuang cried. But between the two of us, there isn't much difference. Why must I live in a humble place like Mount Malinaw while you sit here, gloating over your power, unlimited and unchecked? Stop! The earth shivered as Gugurang stamped his feet on the ground like a big adult man with rational feelings. Asuang only smiled this time. This made Gugurang angry all the more. He struck out, but before his blow could land, Asuang had vanished entirely. Gugurang was greatly amazed by this, because like a shonen hero, Asuang developed 
a power just when he needed it? As Wang discovered that he could make himself invisible. Then, from a short distance in the room, came the voice of the evil one, Asuang. Well, if I can't get fire in goodwill, then I will in bad. I will steal it. Try, said Gugurang, as he searched around for his brother. And before you do, I will cut your mountain in two. Then let there be war between us, countered Asuang, who gives no shit at this point. Thus, good and evil became enemies from that time on. Motives were many to prove that Asuang was ambitious. Again, not an evil trait per se, but okay. It could not be doubted that the power to rule intrigued him. He was determined to oppose every move of Gugurang. Hashtag salty, right? He gathered around him evil counselors and evil spirits whom he sent to the earth to turn people to evil, evil ways. After that, there was much immorality, lawlessness, and crime. Oh no! Gugurang in no time found out that it was Asuang who was causing all this. And you know, not man's nature. Asuang sends pestilence to the barrios, locusts, frogs, eating all the crops. And for a moment, the people turned to the omnipotent for protection. Gugurang, who would not budge unless something was offered, asked for a sacrifice and warned them to follow his commandment strictly or be exterminated by floods or eruption. Again, Gugurang, the good guy, threatening people with floods and eruption. Against Asuang himself, Gugurang was powerless to do anything. It seemed that, in a twinkle of an eye, Asuang came to possess hidden powers hitherto denied to him. Gugurang particularly guarded his fire, lest his enemy make good of his threat of stealing it. He assigned his trusted helpers to guard the symbol of his power. He was afraid, besides, that if the fire were to go out of its confines, the world would be consumed in a mighty, mighty conflagration. Or, you know, fire. Does anyone know what conflagration means? It's, it means giant fire. This story will repeat that word a lot. This story was written by an old lady mm. but in spite of the precaution taken asuang was able to enter and locate the guarded object and with many guiles and wiles he bribed the guards with gold this feels closer to the philippine government we have now there's bribery afoot the temptation was too sweet to be denied hence Asuang was able to obtain possession of Gugurang's fire. Putting it inside a coconut shell, he ran with it. Gugurang, in his throne, not, you know, having paid people to take care of his fire, who event people who were eventually bribed, suddenly noticed that everything around him turned black, and they were cries from the bowels of the volcano. And outside, the world was on fire. Every barrio that Asuang passed caught fire. Whoops. Apparently stealing fire wasn't a good idea after all. Asuang! Gugurang cried. And with this, he flew into the air pursuing the thief. While terror reigned among the people who were powerless against the conflagration, Gugurang and Asuang gave no shits and raced for supremacy. Gugurang must get the fire back or else he would be left with no power at all. All the air around grew hot, but they still went madly on. Again, people are dying in the background of this story. Asuang was nearing his sit seat, and if he could get there just before Gugurang, all would be lost for the good god, would then be under the spell of this evil god. 
Asuwang braced up for the last stride, and just before he was, just when he was about to descend Mount Malinao, Gugurang caught up with him, snatched the fire in the coconut shell, and vanished with it. Asuang was greatly surprised. He could not make himself invisible now, try as he would. Gugurang, on reaching Mount Mayon, returned the fire to its place, and everything was bright again inside. Now, before doing anything else, he set about stopping the conflagration, you know, the fire outside, killing all the people. Only now is he going to stop all that death. <laughs> he bade the heavens to rain continuously, and there was rain. The big fire was under control. The people at once offered sacrifices because they were convinced it was Gugurang who caused the fire because of their wickedness. So, you know, na... The guilt trip, pasila gas, gaslight girl boss, gaslight girl boss Gugurang. Then Gugurang punished the guards by chaining them to the precipices. Then, for his revenge on Aswang, he ordered Linti the lightning and the Lugdog the thunder to strike hard against Mount Malinao that was defying him. Aswang, you know, being the evil, sexy god of this story, decided to bribe. Linti and the Lugdog. What is the use of serving your master when you don't even receive any reward? Wow, that's true. Asked Aswang. Why don't you join me? Here you can have what you want. You can be your own master. Linti, quite taken, asked. You mean what you said? Sure, the wily Aswang answered. Who, Aswang, who knows how to pay people their salaries, apparently. It is true that we were driven like slaves, said the Lugdog, the thunder. And so since then, oh wait, no. Yeah, I think, did they side with Aswang? The story is unclear. At this, Gugurang sends his thunderbolt. Boom! Crash! For several minutes, the world sank and bobbed and sank again. All the mountains creaked. Then, a mighty crashing was made amid the din. Gugurang then ordered the lightning and the thunder to stop. All was over in a few minutes. Then the people noticed that what was once Mount Malina was but half now. And they thanked the omnipotent God for destroying the abode of the devil. The people for a time believed that Aswang was killed. But later his influence was still doing havoc with the populace. We're just blaming Aswang for everything now. Incidentally, man got fire because, well, you know, the world was on fire. Some enterprising few kept some embers to themselves to warm them during the rain. And so this is how all humans got fire out of two gods who, you know, refused to share responsibility, maybe. Gaslight girl boss Gugurang and Aswang who is... You know, just wanted fire. The end. That's the end of Aswang Steals Fire from Gugurang. Also known as our fifth story. Was that our fifth? That was our fifth, right? Let me stretch. I did not... When I first read that story, I did not expect to find parallels with how government is run to this day but that's an analysis for another day yeah right it was like the good god kept demanding sacrifices for people and just like you have to obey me because i'm good meanwhile the evil god causes chaos but he's also the guy who gave everyone like fire and who <laughs> keeps bribing everyone keeps giving everyone like here have more money you'll be happier and like now that i'm old and i need money i'm like yeah i would side with aswang i would side with aswang in a heartbeat ah, yeah mm -hmm. stretch 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 that is our fourth story aswang steals fire which leaves us with 
two more stories? Is it okay if I like take a break from storytelling for a while? Let me just catch my breath. Woohoo! Aswang mahilig sa paninira. Wow! <laughs> wow, what what do you mean? What did Aswang do? Sorry, I'm just getting my phone charger. Drink. I've been drinking so much water. Actually, look, I'm gonna change my break. I'm gonna, you know, steal. How do I say this? I'm gonna steal some food from some bandits like Juan did. Well, let me just... Let me just put that sign up. Because I drank way too much water. I'm gonna do what people do when they drink way too much water. Give me like three minutes. sa atin ang lahat ng bagay ay magkaugnay magkaugnay ang lahat ang lahat ng bagay ay magkaugnay magkaugnay ang lahat ang lahat ng bagay ay magkaugnay magkaugnay ang lahat ang lahat ng bagay ay magkaugnay magkaugnay
Hello, hello, I'm back. How did that song make you feel? <laughs> I flash back so hard to my childhood over that song. So, I put Star Weaver as part two for our current story, but if you guys want to talk about... Wait, let me give the choices again. So, our choices for story are uh, Star Weaver part two, or we can talk about how parental abandonment created a mountain yep i'm back was everyone here for part one do i have to like start with star weaver all over again if i get to that i have a friend who messaged me that she didn't actually get to listen to part one of this Or do I just skip to part two? Let me just give like... Before we start with where we left off, I'm gonna give... <gasps> I accidentally clicked something on full screen. Mm. So before we start with part two and continue where we left off, let me give a brief start summary. Okay, so we weren't here for part one. Is it okay if I start from, from the very very beginning of this? Yes? No? Okay, I'm just gonna give. No, Juan, is it a part of this again? Why is everyone. I think for everyone who wasn't here, I think we've all decided that the character of Juan, the folklore, the folklore character of Juan is like the Filipino version of Florida Man. Florida Juan. So, Star Weaver is a story that's based on Igorot folklore. It's something that I wrote myself. Mm, that is pieced together from many different versions of this. So what happened was there was this star weaver, one of the many daughters of the sky god, who decided to descend to the human world using wings that she wove herself because she didn't want to be in the sky anymore. She found it boring. And so having <laughs> i'm being distracted by one so anyway this star weaver she went in secret to the human world she met a farmer she joined their village they fell in love they got a ch they had a child together and now their child their very curious child uh, she, that child will now accidentally <laughs> cause the star weaver to go back to the realm of the gods which she tried to escape from and so that's where we left off let me let me go back like a few paragraphs this is the start of star weaver part two the star weaver eventually gets used to the everyday life of being a human the villagers learn to accept her as their own she can read the weather weather better than anyone she knows when it will rain she knows when it will be sunny she learned to weave with many colors instead of the monochromatic weaves that she did back in the realm of the gods. And in turn, she taught the villagers how to weave blessings into their cloth. She listened intently as the farmer taught her about the plants and the seasons, how the seemingly mon mundane acts of the gods in the celestial realm could influence his entire livelihood. He didn't get mad when she apologized about how she may have, you know, she didn't know that she had his entire life on the palm of her hands when she was still a goddess. And unlike the people in the realm of the gods, this human farmer never asked the star weaver to hold back on her emotions or her opinions. The star weaver fell in love with the human world. She fell in love with him. When he asked her to marry him, she immediately said yes. A child was soon born to them. This child, they looked just like their father, but had all of their mother's boundless energy and curiosity. Also, as a side note, I'm using they as a gender-neutral pronoun. It makes writing this one so this story much easier for me. So when this child was old enough to explore their, on their own, they would 
sometimes bring home items from their adventures. Shiny rocks, a snack from the village grandma, herbs. And then one day, Mother, look what I found! One day, the child brought home a pair of muddy wings from the riverbank. The sky opened up as soon as the star weaver saw her discarded wings. The child was spirited away to the heavens, leaving a small window of time for her to chase after them. Go, said the farmer. I'll follow. And so, without hesitation, the star weaver went back to the heavens to fetch their child. Left behind, the farmer took on an epic quest to reunite with his wife and child. But again, this story isn't about the farmer. Many tales have been told about the farmer. This is about the star weaver, who now was fighting with her father, the sky god. <clears throat> Did I not tell you? The father roared. Cavorting with humans is forbidden for our kind. They're different from what you said, father. They did not harm me in any way. Just because they didn't harm you now doesn't mean that they won't harm you in the future. You and your child will now live in the skies with me. If you reunite with the farmer, you will never be allowed back here again. Is that a promise? asked the weaver. It's a curse, replied the father. And while this fight was happening, the weaver and the farmer's child was having the time of their life, being doted on by the other star weavers. See, celestial beings are born few and far between. The star we the other star weavers, sister of our her heroine, they were overjoyed by the chance to become aunties to this energetic, half-human, half-celestial child. Now, our star weaver was eventually sent to her room with no materials to use for weaving. But the birds who can travel to and from the human and celestial realms, they heard of her tale and they started bringing her things that she loves from the human world. Golden stalks of rice, betel nuts, indigo blossoms, fresh grass, white cotton, and the like. Using what she has learned from the human villagers, our star weaver makes thread from the bird's presence and weaves a cloth that would be long enough for her to use to climb down. She was almost finished with that colorful tapestry of red and orange and yellow and green and blue and shades of purple. You can see where I'm going with this, right? When she heard someone shout from the clouds below, I am the farmer from the village below. I have come to fetch my wife and child. The weaver hurriedly runs off with her cloth to meet her husband. So does her child, who left a bevy of worried aunties on their trail. My love! Father! Stop! cried the sky god. Did I not tell you that you can never return him here if you go back with him? The star weaver didn't even look back. Emboldened by her child's hand holding hers, she rolled out her tapestry of many colors and slid down to the cloud where her husband was. Their child followed without hesitation. Only when she was at the same cloud as the family that she built for herself, did she turn to face her sobbing relatives. I am one of them now, father. I choose to be one of them. What about you, grandchild? Do you not wish to leave, live here with me or your aunties? The sky god implored. I will even make a place in the sky just for you. I'm so lucky, the child replied, with the characteristic mirth of their mother when she was still the same age. Every time I look at the sky from the land below, I can see my grandpa and my aunties. I love all of you. And the farmer too. Took the opportunity to talk to the god who has taken care of him and his people for all his life. 
Thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. I promise to take good care of your daughter and your grandchild for as long as I live. The Sky God, he had to admit at this point that there was nothing else that he can do to dissuade their kin from leaving. Using his almighty power, he made the Star Weaver's tapestry longer and longer, constructing a colorful but temporary bridge that linked the world of the Celestials to the world of the humans. Bidding their final farewells, the humans went back to Earth together. The farmer stayed true to his promise of taking good care of his family until he died of old age. The weaver followed him, followed him in the afterlife soon, having become just as mortal as he was. Their child grew up and had their own children, and their children had children, who in turn had children, thinning down the celestial blood that once flowed through their family's veins. And sometimes, when the sky god misses his child and grandchild, he will roll down that colorful tapestry after a good long cry. The tapestry became what we humans now call the rainbow. And sometimes another celestial being would use the tapestry as a one-way ticket to the world below to fulfill the cursed or promised life of becoming just as human as we are. So that, my friends, chat, is the origin of the rainbow and why there are fewer gods now than there were before. And that is the story of the Star Weaver. An adaptation of several Igorot folktales of the same theme. I hope you guys like that one. <laughs> one is everywhere, he is everyone. <laughs> Stop bringing one to this. Maybe one is maybe one is one of the children. Who knows? But yes, that is the story of the Star Weaver. How did you guys like that? I'm kind of nervous because I wrote that one on my own. Using a lot of research. Oh my, is my internet quality going down? Shit. Can anyone still hear me? Hello? Hi, chat. Hi. Mm -hmm. Let me just check for a while. Okay, the delay and transmission is not that bad. I dig it. Thank you, Val. Thank you for digging... My adaptation of a bunch of Igorot folklores of the same theme. Uh, what else? What else? We have one more story left if you guys want to listen to that one. It's the story about parental abandonment. <laughs> I decided to pick that story because it might be like the revenge of the mother after... Our first story was about killing someone's mom, so... Okay, there's a bit of delay. Okay, good, good, good. Now I know. Uh, my internet is turning orange right now. Do you guys want another story? Do you guys want to learn about how Mount... What Mount was that again? Mount Iraya. The origin of Mount Iraya. Let me just fix my net for a while. Oh. Oh. Is the delay still bad? Is it still bad? Let me check. I have like another account that's monitoring this one. Is it still bad? Okay, the delay is... It's okay. It's alright. Right? We're left with one last story. How is everyone in chat feeling? Please get some water. Please get some snacks. 
will probably still be here for I'd say a good five minutes let me just stretch mm -hmm. and let me know if you're ready to start testing testing yeah it sends it sends okay my my internet is turning red I think I'll just leave this story, The Charms of Mount Iraya, for next time when my internet is doing better. <laughs> so, chat, how are we feeling? How was the storytelling? Let me just remove the sad mom's photo. Oh, shit, I removed the entire background. Mm -hmm. How's everyone doing? How's everyone doing this chat? I mean, this night. I hope you enjoyed Tonight's storytelling, I kind of plan to do more in the future. Maybe. Oh, it's good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sara. I just read the message right now. I'm not sure how much delay was that from this, from how I'm talking now. Oh, okay, okay. The delay is getting better, I think. It was fun. You did great. Thank you, Val. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna end this stream now before my internet gets too shit to continue. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Once again, I'm Maya Maya Magindara. I'm a mermaid VTuber and folklore nerd who started VTubing due to seeing a bunch of Philippine folklore people gather together. Um... Thank you very much again for being here. I plan to do more folklore streams in the future. Oh, thank you very much, Moonbule. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I I know this is... <laughs> Stop making me feel good, you guys. <laughs> First time's a good time. Thank you, Ninja Boss. Uh, so, yeah, I plan on doing this in the future more of this in the future uh if you missed a bunch of the stories i'm gonna upload this to youtube eventually maybe someone doing their high school assignment might find this who knows it might help someone and aside from folklore streams i'm trying to set up a crafting stream so i can just spend an entire day embroidering with you guys as someone with grandma hobbies i kind of want to stream embroidery and doll making aside from you know the usual video games and stuff maybe a karaoke when my throat feels a, a little better so uh, <laughs> oh crafting stream right are you guys interested in that i'm gonna teach you guys how to make like felt dolls it's super easy all you really need to make dolls are like two, three kinds of uh, creation mitts. Do you guys want a creation mitt right now? I could like pick something up super easily. Uh huh. Let me see. Let me see. Let's find some short creation mitt. Mm -hmm. This book has like an entire fuck ton of chapters on creation mitts. Fuck ton of stories. Uh huh. Hmm. Oh, that's short. Okay, okay, let me find a creation mitt that won't get us murdered by my stupid internet. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want another story from Bicol or do you guys want something from Pampanga I'm oh are there any pantheons too I'm I came across one story with pantheons that was about the great flood I was planning to just have a stream of just about gods and goddesses but if you want like a short creation story right now I didn't exactly research for this but I can give you one or two do you guys want for creation myth do you want Something from Pampanga, something from Bicol, or something from the Visayas. Let me just put that in chat. Creation myth.
Which one do you guys want? There's... There is a lot, but that's the easiest I could get right now. Pampanga. We have one vote for Pampanga. Well, Pampanga's pretty short. I could, like, tell this story and then move on to another one if you guys want more. So, this is the creation of the world according to the people from Pampanga. A long, long time ago... The universe was still full of gods and goddesses. Of all these gods, there existed one supreme god by the name of Manget Chai. He ruled the universe for several millennia with great power. These gods lived in different planets. Oh wait, fuck! The gods are aliens! Holy shit! I did not expect this. I'm reading this for the first time. Our gods are aliens. These gods lived in different planets. And their common temple was suspended in the air. Oh, okay. Bye, Zara. Have a good dinner. <laughs> Please eat something more than canned tuna this time. Have a good rest of the stream. Yes, thank you very much. If you're streaming next time, I'll try to catch that too. Okay, called it. Yeah, the gods are aliens. <clears throat> so these gods, these gods from the Pangpangalor, they lived in different planets. And their common temple was suspended in the air. These planets were far apart. It took hundreds of years to go from one planet to another. The great god who ruled over them lived in the sun. And his bride lived in the moon. Fucking this is Sailor Moon. Venus, their daughter, lived in a planet that was called after her name. The supreme god sent for all of his vassals to meet in a great council to decide on a certain affair on the, in the universe. The gods responded to the call and the elements were greatly disturbed by the swiftness of their chariots. As soon as they gazed at the beautiful daughter of Manget Chai, who was seated on her golden chair, the gods were charmed by her beauty. Seems to be a common theme in Filipino myths. Everyone's a simp. Instead of deciding on their affair of the universe, the gods proposed marriage to the pretty goddess. Everyone got distracted by this very beautiful goddess, it seems. The great god who, you know, this wasn't his plan. This wasn't like what this meeting was for. He was troubled. And he did not know on whom he should confer the hand of his daughter. Finally, he decided that the question was to be settled by combat. Okay, so the daughter has no say. Everyone just gets to fight. Okay, fine. The gods returned to their respective abodes and made the necessary preparations. The encounter lasted for several thousands of years and nearly all the gods perished. What? During the battle, the daughter of Manga Chai died. <laughs> And consequently, the trouble ended. <laughs> wow, what a great tale. <laughs> the great god. After the combat, looked down and saw the earth of today to his great surprise. The earth was formed by the great masses of stone used in the fight. The great god, for his daughter's sake, blessed the world with trees and life. And that was how the earth was formed according to Pampanga folklore. People died. Gods died because sexy is distracting. That is the moral lesson of this stream, apparently. Sexy is very distracting. You guys want another creation story? Or, you know, that was fine, right? We still have like a Visayas one and a Bicol one. Oh, there are three for Bicol. I can just like pick one from Bicol. You guys want more like creation stories? Let me know, chat. Is the Bicol one more spicy? I don't know. I'm reading all of these for the first time. Mm-hmm. Well, the Bicol one actually kind of has more of the Pantheon of Gods. And the Visayas one... 
Hmm, the besides one has also has a pantheon. It also has aliens. Okay, so my choice, my choice. Uh hmm, let me see. Let me just briefly read through all of these. Let's go for Visaya since most of our tales have come from Bicol for today. So, the creation of the world according to Visayan folklore. At a time many, many years ago, so long ago that man's imagination could no longer reach it back, there was no land. All was an immense sea that nobody knew where it commenced or where it led to. That seems like paradise to me. Then the years and the ages passed. Nobody knew where the sky or the earth or the wind or the clouds were. Now, there was a king who guided the destiny of space. The king of all cosmos. This is now Katamari Damashi. This was King Manaul. He was tired and he wanted to rest. There was no place where he could rest. He decided that the earth and the sky should wage war with each other. Wow, that's always the answer, war. The war went on for a long time. Nobody knew how long it lasted. Thus, the years dragged by. It was known then, it was known that when the king blew with all of his fury, it raged huge waves and nobody knew how far they reached above. Tired, the king of the air, Manaul, clawed from the depths of the ocean many many rocks which were so big that many people could neither raise nor move any of them. He lifted those rocks in the air and cast them below. He did this in various places and put an end to the war. Finally, he succeeded in separating the waves and the winds. The rocks he had thrown below formed the land of the islands of Iraya one of which being that of Bugto, which is now known as the island of Negros. Yeah, war never changes. The eternal solution to everything? Start a war. There were neither trees nor plants, and all got scorched in the heat of the sun. At that very moment, King Manaul wanted a place where he could rest from the heat of the sun. Hmm. So he called his general, Maguayan, who up to this time took the name of the plant Kawayan or spiny bamboo. The word spiny was mag at that time, I didn't know that, which also meant one most high. So as a magindara, am I also most high? I'm taking this as a canon, I'm also most high now. <laughs> Maguayan afterwards went far away. He was away for a long time. At length, he returned after many years. He immediately threw a piece of spiny bamboo which floated on the water. The winds blew and the seas carried it to the island where it grew. The place was beautiful, so beautiful indeed that King Manaul felt its charms. One day, while he sat alone under this spiny plant's branches, he heard some voice which came from inside the bamboo. He went near the bamboo plant and opened it with his beak. So Manaul is a bird now? You know what? Let's not question Manaul. We didn't question one. Let's not question Manaul. Manaul is a bird now. From one of the nodules came forth man, and from another, a woman. King Manaul called the man Sikalak, and the latter, the woman, Sikabai. And from those two came the other people from whom sprang mankind. So that's, that got Adam and Evie on me. Adam and Evie. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Pokemon. That's wrong. That's not the right, that's not the right tale. Adam and Evie. And that is the, one of the many creation myths from the Visayas region. We still have Beacle if you guys still want that. You could also suggest another topic. 
I have three books with me. I can go on all day or for as long as my throat would let me. I just happened to have like five prepared earlier. But now, now we're just here. Chat's choice of stories. Oh, the giant that supports the world. That's interesting. Very good. Have you ever come across a specific creation myth? Which one? Which one, Ninja Boss? I actually have it like three gods on a platform. Hmm. Where is it from? Where is it from? Maybe we could find that. Or maybe we could... Three gods, one platform also sounds sus. One winged one, one multi-headed one. And one I do not remember. Okay. I don't have like... I didn't really read a lot of creation myths in preparing for this. But if I find it, um, I'll let you know. Do you have like Twitter or how can I... I don't know. It was back in fourth grade. Is this from like a Filipino textbook or something? I have vague recollections of this one i'm going to need to find that one like how many pages does this book have on an english vibal book <laughs> vibal vibal our eternal publisher of 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 textbooks let me see. How many pages does it have on creation myth? 67 to 100. Okay, so this book has like 40 pages worth of creation myth. So I'm going to need to scar that one for more snake people. Let me see if I can find more snake people. We don't actually have that, that many stories about snake people. I was actually surprised that I find found that one. Sexy snake people. Hmm. I'm in the wrong book. Sexy snake people should be on legends. Sexy snake people. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Effects of encounters with Capre. Encanto at Palungtot. When they love. The lady hitchhiker. What the fuck is this about? Uh huh. I did not pay attention in school. Honestly, same. I regretted it eventually, but same. Mm -hmm. Horse people. Okay, horse people. Of course there's horse people. Tikbalangs are a thing. Let me see if I can find a tikbalang story. Let me see, let me see. I know there's an entire chapter on Tikbalangs in the, one of these books. Matanda sa lupa, matanda sa punso, the sea nymph, Santilmo, the Tikbalang. Oh! Oh! I learned something new. So, a lot of Tikbalang tales are actually from the Tagalog region. Missed out on them Filipino folk tales. So we have a lot of Tikbalang folk tales from the Tagalog region. We have one from Mindoro. We have one from the Visayas region. Let me just pick one at random. There are no ones in this story. Okay, let's... Let's get a story about the Tikbalang. The Tikbalang is a very tall and thin man. It is said that the color of his body is dark. Yeah, Mindoro. There's a Tikbalang story in Mindoro. Are you for? No. Yeah, let's not ask. Let's. I won't. Yeah. I'm not going to ask where everyone's from. 
So, the tikbalang, his limbs are thin and as, as the limbs of a skeleton and his head is like that of a horse. The tikbalang lives in trees, usually in bamboos. These trees are distinguished from others because they are green. If a person happens to pass one of these trees, the tikbalang will take him by the hand and lead him astray. The man will never again find the right road unless, unless he takes off his clothes and wears them inside out. Are tikbalang's twinks, are tall people twinks? That is the question. If they count, then maybe. They can be twinks if you want them to be. It is said that when a person, when persons are stepped on by the tikbalang, they will have a headache or they will become blind. Sometimes they get a fever. To cure these sicknesses caused by the tikbalang, persons must use lipang aso, that's a kind of leaf, or the so-called tianak hair which is found in balete trees. Holy shit, that is so sus now that you read it right out loud. Which one? Which one is sus? The lipang aso or tianak hair as a remedy must be taken to the place where the person was trampled upon by the tikbalang. Then it must be turned. In this way, the person will get well in a short time if only period cramps were healed just as easily. The tikbalang possesses other powers such as making people turn crazy or turning them into a form of a horse. These powers are shown by these two stories. The tikbalang with undressing and redressing. Um, yeah, now that I think about it, I don't want to think about it anymore. Yeah, let's not think about that. I like, you know, having my brain cells not ruined by, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to answer that anymore. Yeah, never mind. So, these two stories about the Tikbalang. Let's go for one of them. It's very short. Once upon a time, there lived a couple who had a son. It happened one day that while this young man was on the balcony of their house, at about seven o'clock in the evening, a lady came in front of their house. She asked them to go with her. The man went with her, for he thought that she was his sweetheart. You're already married, sir. The young lady resembled very much his sweetheart. This man did not return for two days. His parents became impatient over his absence, so they went to search for him. Oh, wait, no, the man was not married. He's the son, sorry. I was confused. The man saw his sweetheart, so he left with them. And now his parents are worried. Okay, that's my recap. After a few days search, they found him in a forest. He was running after a horse with a very tired look. Oh no. His parents threw a rope in order to catch him. When he was brought home, he was found to be crazy. Or maybe he's a furry. We don't know. Since then, he has remained in that state. His parents found no remedy to cure him. Another story is about a girl. This is also in connection with the Tikbalang, another story about a girl. This girl was also lost and taken by the Tikbalang. Her family could not find her. But after three days, she was found at the tip of a bamboo. She came down and ran so fast that her pursuers could not catch her. When their attempt to catch her was in vain, they let her go and went home to find other means in order to take her. The next day, a man riding in a banka, banka passed by the tree where the tikbalang lived. It chanced that while he was there, a big thing suddenly fell down. The man found that it was a girl. When he looked above, he saw a person sitting on his heels with an ugly look. The family of the girl, hearing of this news, went to get her. Oh, this is not a happy story. But to their great distress, she was found dead. Um, yay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> this is... This is giving me bad vibes. Did you guys? Did any of... Anyone from chat ever got a chance to watch Liwai, the movie? It's free on YouTube right now. It's, it's about a little boy who grew up in prison. 
this story reminded me of that because one of the ways that okay so i'm not going to spoil it but one of the ways where the mother of this child who was being raised in prison one of the ways where she got to talk openly about dark things without the child getting to you know know about terrible terrible truths about the universe was through using folklore so the story was set in martial law and sometimes they would use the word capre as like a code for the police or for like big scary men in general and she also used the story of the diwata quote-unquote to tell about her own experiences with her out her child like getting disillusioned about the reality of the world so if you haven't watched it yet it's on youtube it's mm, it's posted by the director or the writer of the story itself it's on kip obianda's youtube page the entire movie for free with english subs if you're interested in checking that out the tikbalang story kind of reminded me of that in a way that it's kind of dark and sad what did i just read i'm so sorry chat that was disturbing do you guys want more that was disturbing do you guys want more <laughs> like Again, I have like three books behind me, so I can go on. Mm -hmm. I love disturbing content. Well, a lot of Filipino folklore, at least in the way that Damiana Eugenio collated them. They're not very like, they don't usually have moral stories, especially monster stories they're usually like there's this monster it did this horrible thing the end you know kind of like my grandpa's story earlier about calamansi juice and eating from places that you don't know it's kind of like that that's a lot of filipino folklore in general about monsters do you guys want monsters give me a monster i'll see if anything's here mm -hmm. incidentally i tried looking for stories about mermaids and it's kind of sad that there really aren't a lot like almost all places in the philippines they admit that mermaids exist there are tales about mermaids but no there are no tales they're more like everyone is everyone knows that mermaids exist but no one has any like tales about them no one know no one has like any serious stories about them it's more like mermaids they're there the end sometimes they eat you magindara lore there's none uh, there's none i tried i tried finding all we know about the magindara like me is that we exist and somehow we eat people or maybe we didn't hi yo hey welcome to the stream i just finished like five selected stories earlier that one pick in true filipino horror stories number something i did not get to read those collection of books unfortunately maybe i should start collecting them now so yeah hi uh i just finished like five stories earlier now we're collecting we're at reader's choice let's make magindara lore i'm making magindara lore as myself i would like to think i'm gonna get struck by lightning from for that i feel so what you guys want more stories i'm at that book with like monster stories right now so there's a chapter on hmm, there's a chapter on a swang <laughs> i'm gonna get smited yes there's a chapter on a swang a chapter on devil the capre the duende encanto not the disney movie ghost legends nuno sapunso mermaids there's not much 
San Tilmo, Tianak, Tikbalang, and Random Miscellaneous Supernatural Beings. Incidentally, this is the book where I got the Sexy Snake Lady vs. Twink story. <laughs> Let's not go back to Tikbalang. It's sad. <laughs> Tikbalang stories are kind of sad. Aha, uh -huh, Encanto. So, these are the ones with all the Maria Maria. We have Maria Makiling, Maria Sinukuan, Encanto of... Hmm, pick a place. We have Tagalog, we have Mindoro, Waray, Bicol again, Ilocos, Cebuano, Masabate. <laughs> Hindi kayo nun? Oh, I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick at random. Hmm... Let me see. Okay, uh, what is an encanto anyway? Encanto is uh, the generic term for fairies in Filipino folklore. They are usually women, magical women, who live in the forest. Now, this is another trivia from my grandfather who keeps telling me bullshit as a child. To differentiate humans from encanto, you have to check under their nose. You know this like groove under your nose, the filtrum? Like, yeah, this, like just in the middle of your nostrils, that groove. All humans have that. Encantos don't. Encantos have a smooth, like smooth skin, smooth flesh under their nose. And that's how you can tell who's human and who is Encanto. According to my grandpa, who... You know, is my grandpa and should not be trusted as a source of 100% truth. But yeah, that's the trivia for today. <laughs> More trivia from my grandfather. Thank you very much, grandfather, for passing this weird knowledge down. Okay, so picking Encanto stories. Do you guys want an Encanto from the river or an Encanto from the trees is our choice. River or trees? River or trees? My filtrum is very shallow. Oh no. Now we know. You're an encanto. Oh dear. Please don't tell on me to your other kind. I don't want to get, you know, spirited away. Trees. Okay, trees. You guys want to know about the balete tree? The balete tree is like very popular, right? Okay, the encanto of the balete tree. The Fairy of the Balete Tree is a story from the Tagalog region. It stars a man named Ambo. Unfortunately, he's not one. <clears throat> so, the Fairy of the Balete Tree. As Ambo was planting bananas in his piece of land, a strange fear came upon him. Once in a while, he cast a glance at the big Balete Tree that grew not more than 20 meters away. Many stories about this tree were told by the village people in those old days. For example, they told of strange no noises that they hear there at night. Sometimes people said that they saw lights in it. It seemed that people often heard the sound of merrymaking at midnight when there was not even a single house within a kilometer of it. These same people also told of other people disappearing in fields, and nobody knew where they went. Two years passed. Ambo went to the banana plantation to gather the fruits of the bananas that he had planted before. He walked through the plantation, but he saw not a single bunch ready to be gathered. He came home in anger. Impossible, he cried. Maybe somebody has been stealing my bananas. Oh no, I will find out even if I have to watch this field all night. So, at twilight, after supper, he went to the field and hid himself behind a thick bush. He had not been there for long when he caught sight of somebody gathering his bananas. He stood up and drew his bolo. With his bolo gleaming in the dim light of early evening, he rushed after the thief. 
he was surprised to see that the thief did not run away. Ambo stopped and stood still as he stared at the beautiful girl dressed in pure red. She was the most beautiful girl he had e ever seen. This is... Man, Filipino folklore, men are so weak to girls, to beautiful women. You have been stealing my bananas. Here, take my other banana, said Ambo. I mean, Ambo said. You have been stealing my bananas, he said, to this beautiful girl dressed all in red. Oh, I came to gather only a bunch. Now that I know that you are the owner of the bananas, I wish to ask permission, replied the girl. She came close to him. He could not move a muscle as she came closer. His banana grew hard. She stretched a beautiful hand to Ambo. Then, when she had touched him, he fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up, the banana plantation was gone. The balete tree was gone too. Instead, he and the girl were in front of a big house. Light streamed out of the window, and the sound of laughter floated distinctly in the silence of the night. This is our home, she said. We're having a celebration. Please come in. He could not be persuaded to come in, for at that time he remembered that his mother was waiting for him. She came close to him and caught his hands. Then together they went in and sat among the laughing women who were eating all kinds of food. He ate and drank and laughed and sang and danced. Everyone was friendly to him. The girl persuaded Ambo to stay, but as he remembered his mother, he would not stay. No sooner had he uttered something that he fell into a deep sleep again. The world seemed to spin around him. When he came to, he found himself at his plantation again. It was still early evening. The girl was gone. He went home and told his mother of his wonderful adventure. Stories of a similar kind were told by his mother, and it was believed that this fairy was called Mariang Ilea. And that is the fairy in the balete tree. As told by this collection of stories by Damiana Eugenio. Mm, incidentally, my grandfather, it's always my grandfather. <laughs> my grandfather had a similar tale from the, my grandfather is Ilongo. So, you know, prime place for, it's the prime place for Aswang and fairy stories. My grandfather told of a tale of a taxi driver in Iloilo. So there's taxis now. This is a more modern tale. That once upon a time, there was this taxi driver in Iloilo City. He, it was midnight and someone like hailed to him like, I want to ride your taxi. And it was a very, very beautiful woman. And like the taxi driver was like, shit, I, I, I have to go home. But this woman is so pretty. So maybe she'll be my last trip. And this woman, she asked him to go to a different part of Iloilo, a part of the city where everything was old. And look, a lot of parts of Iloilo, if you've ever been there, there's a lot of really, really old buildings and really, really old houses. So this his passenger asked to be dropped off there and he agreed because again, she's pretty and a common theme of our stories is Men are really, really weak to very beautiful women. So this taxi driver, he drove to that place. He, you know, the woman got down at a place where there's a very, very big house. And there's a huge party. And the woman thanked him and she didn't invite the taxi driver inside. But she did pay him handsomely for the trip. And then... The taxi driver went home. When he got home, he saw the money that was paid to him by this very beautiful passenger. And he, he was like, this isn't money. This is leaves. 
I got paid in leaves. How did I not notice this? So the taxi driver, he went back to that big, big house. It was already morning by the time he got back. And instead of a huge house, he saw a very, very old tree. He asked around in the area if there's like, maybe you just missed it, big house. Had a party last night and all the people told him there's no house there. There's just that big tree and that tree is home to the Encantos. So, so sorry, Mr. Taxi Driver Man. You got tricked and you'll never get your money back. The end. That is the tale of three encantos according to my grandpa who is a really really weird guy and told me weird shit <laughs> frank yeah frank by encantos poor taxi driver ah, yeah. got any more requests for stories i'm gonna find some short ones Oh, okay, while you mull over requests, I'm gonna need to take another break. Let me just... How did I put that break? Scene again, story title. Okay, that's not it. Uh, BRB... What should I break message be this time? Uh, trees. Tree party. I'm gonna take, like, another... Three minute break maybe just to drink some water and let my throat rest for a bit
I forgot to unmute. Hello, chat. I'm back. Do you have like any more story requests for me? I'm gonna remove that BRB tree party thing. More encantos, more more capres. We haven't heard about capres yet. If you guys want that, more origin stories. Uh huh. Whoa, I got to the Noah's Ark part of this book. Wow. So, what did we learn today? Well, you guys are. I'm still taking requests, but to summarize what we've learned today, some of our gods are aliens. People are very, very weak to sexy monster women. That's Philippine folklore in a nutshell. We have a lot of sexy monster women. Maybe. Hmm. You guys want Chanox or Duendis? Chanox or Duende? <laughs> like, I want to terrify myself. And those are the two most terrifying monsters for me. Oh, this story is about a man named Rodrigo. I don't want to read that right now. Chanak for spoopy. Okay, let's find something about the Chanak. Mm -hmm. Okay, like the Duende, eh, like the Tikbalang, a lot of Chanak stories are Tagalog based. You have like three from Tagalog and one from the Tagalog region and one from Pampanga. So, hmm, which one, which one? Chanak are worse, so let's go for those little shits. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm giving a cursory glance on which is most horrifying. Or which is most interesting. Do you want a Chanak story about parents or a Chanak story about children? It's our choices. The one with, about the parents is shorter than the one about children. Incidentally, I've never read any of these before. So let's find out about Chanox together. One about parents or one about children. Parents or children, that's our choices. Hmm. Oh, this one isn't about the baby. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go for the one with children. So this is a story from the Tagalog region called Bata and the Tianak. One night, when there was a great silver moon on the sky, many children were outside playing piko in the yard. Because, you know, back then, no video games. And, you know, very, very little security. Perfect time to get kidnapped. Their mothers were watching as they played merrily. As they became tired of running, they proposed to have another kind of game. Bata, the youngest, among them suggested Taguan. You know, super safe choice, hide and seek in the middle of the night. Nothing can go wrong here. Everybody agreed with him. For that reason, Bata quickly ran to the Kaimin to hide. While he was running, he shouted to his comrades, Look for me when I cry it! And in the Kaingin, he could not decide whether it was better for him to climb up a tree or stay among the bushes. During the time he stood there thinking of what to do, he saw a fair child with bright and sparkling eyes coming towards him. Is this really about the Chanak? I mean, it says it's about the Chanak, so yeah. At first, Bata did not pay attention to the child and continued thinking. The little one called his name and offered him a piece of puto. Pata smiled when he saw the puto and addressed the child thus. How did you find my name? <clears throat> Let me just, I'm sorry for this voice. Because I wanted to hear it from the other children. And what's your name? Pata asked again. People call me Chanak, was the answer. Pata wanted to ask more questions. But he heard the voices of his playmates. 
were coming towards the place where he and Tianak stood. So he told the Tianak, Let's hide now for they are coming. Super safe thing to do with someone named Tianak. Alright, follow me. I'll show you a good hiding place, said the Tianak, and then ran away. Pata followed him. Pata's playmates became so impatient waiting for his it. Ah, taya. I just realized that it means taya. Waiting for his it that they went to the kaing to search for him, even though he did not shout. Some of the children climbed the guava tree where Bata used to hide, and others went around the bushes, but no one found him. Hide and seek champion Bata. Then they began to shout where he was, but Bata did not answer them. So they told his mother to call him. His mother shouted as loud as she could, but Bata, having been led astray by this Tianak, could not hear his mother. The shouts of Bata's mother disturbed many people who were already sleeping at that time. The night was not too late for those people to run to the place where the noise came from, in order to find out what was the matter. As soon as they learned that Bata had disappeared, they began searching for him. They suspected that Bata was laid astray by a Tianak. His playmates ran quickly to their houses and rushed to their beds when they heard the news. They're not helping at all. But to be fair, someone got kidnapped, I think. The persons who went in search of Bata, carrying torches with them, moved about from Keingen to Keingen until they heard the crocs crowing, which announced daybreak. By the time they were so tired and they were forced to go home, all they did, they had not been successful. Bata's mother alone remained in one of the Kaingins, searching, which was useless. Being worn with sorrow, she sat upon a rock under a mango tree in order to rest for a few minutes, but there she fell asleep and would not have woken up till noon, perhaps if a man did not wake her and told her that he had found her son. Very early in the morning, that man went to the Kaingen to get a bunch of ripe bananas, again bananas. He went about to cut the shoot of a plant when he saw Bata with a cluster of banana with he saw Bata within a cluster of banana plants nearby. The poor child whose open eyes were sunken as if he had been sick for a long time had his arm around the banana plant. The man tried to take Bata out of the place but the child was immovable. For that reason he quickly ran to the child's mother. The mother went to her beloved son. When she arrived then, many people, some who were trying to set the child free from his grip on the banana tree, crowded around the place. And they could not move Bata or make him talk, so they decided to call a priest to bless the child and his surroundings in order to drive away the evil spirit. After the performance of these holy blessings, the people did not have any difficulty in taking Bata out of his prison. Bata was ill for many days. When he recovered, his mother asked him how, how he happened to be within the grove of the banana plants. He said that Tianak led him to a beautiful place where many plants with pretty flowers were growing. At first he liked that place, and he forgot his playmates because... The Tianak gave him so much puto. <laughs> I mean mood. I would stay for puto. At, they did not stop eating even though they were playing. But soon he remembered his mother who loved him very much and he told Tianak he would go home. Tianak said to him, Why would you wish to go home? Because my mother doesn't know where I am. Tianak did not want Bata to go home. But Bata was thinking of his mother, insisted upon going home until Tianak told him angrily, You may do whatever you wish, and disappeared. The child, being very anxious to go home, did not stop to think how Tianak disappeared, but walked through the place where he thought his house was. He walked for several hours, but he could not find his way home. 
when he became very tired he lay down on the ground under the bamboo grove he did not know how he came among the banana plants or how his mother found him so this is the Tianak origin story according to this tale it is a general belief that the spirit of any baby that dies before it's baptized becomes a Tianak the Tianaks always ramble in lonely places and they generally mislead young folks. They are usually invisible, but sometimes they are visible. They have the power to be either, as one may be safe from being left as ahem, anyone may be safe from being led astray by the Tianaks if again if he would wear his dress inside out. So Tianaks in this case they're not the scary fang babies who would climb back up to your womb in this case sometimes they're just tiny fairy babies they're like changelings i guess in fairy lore in european fairy lore that wasn't that wasn't horrifying that was just some kid getting lost mm -hmm. okay i found another chanak story are you guys up for another Chanak story? I'm kind of disappointed with that one. Chanak story? Chanak story, anyone? Different from movie Chanaks. I found something that's closer to movie Chanaks. Let me see. Also from the Tagalog region. Hmm. The Chanak, a story from the Tagalog region. There lived once upon a time a young couple who had been married only a month said the husband let's go and plant palai in the country so that we shall have plenty to eat anak ni Janice, that's right <laughs> so they started for the palai field and the road ran through a forest there they saw a baby sitting on the root of a tree and crying piteously wah, wah. the soft-hearted woman said to her husband can't we take the poor little thing perhaps it will live and it's so pretty the husband agreed and they went on they stopped to rest and the woman said to her husband there's no milk in my breast but perhaps it will grow quiet if i let it have a little suck as a treat let the child suck a titty as a treat so she nestled the little thing close up to her bosom and gave it the breast but as soon as the baby's lips touched her she cried out aray kong dios it's biting me yeah that's how the story reads it aray kong dios it's biting me but her husband thought of it only as a jest for how can a baby so young bite after a few minutes she lay very still and her husband thought she was asleep and went away for a short time you know just leave your wife with a strange baby nothing wrong with that when he returned he saw she was dead and flying through the forest the baby has wings he could see the baby the baby has wings i didn't know chanox could fly then he was sorry that he had not killed the baby instead of showing it kindness for surely it was a tianak I did not know that they could fly. I have vague recollections of that movie, that very, very old movie where there was like an army of Chanaks like crawling up the ceiling. It's fucking terrifying. It's still a part of my nightmares, but uh, apparently in some folklore, they can fly. Tianaks, they fly. I remember they can jump. Yeah, I know, right? I know they can jump. They're like tiny baby zombies in the movies baby zombies that want to crawl up your womb <laughs> so sub chat we've been here for almost three hours now i think okay this this time for sure <laughs> this time for sure i'm going to end the stream again thank you very much for being here i'm maya maya magandar mermaid vtuber and folklore nerd folklore geek not a nerd being a nerd implies that i know what i'm talking about being a geek implies that this is a hobby so yes uh hi chat are you still there thank you very much for tuning in and for 
you know, enjoying my weird stories from my grandpa and stories from these three books that I have behind me. Folklore Otaku. Um, yes, I guess that's accurate. <laughs> that is accurate. So I'm guessing based on this stream that you guys probably want another one next time. Maybe I'll ask. But next time I'll probably be more prepared. I'll read more. Next stream probably I'm gonna set up a team. Unless you guys want like a whole stream of just about one. The Florida Man of the Philippines. You guys want a one stream? Just some of you weren't here at the first part of the stream. We talked about this weird story about a dude named Juan who boiled his mother to death and pissed on a band bunch of bandits. Maybe if one day we'll have a full stream of just stories about Juan and Maria. That's gonna be super weird. It sounds boring, but that's gonna be weird. Monster story is fine. Gods and goddess story is fine. One day. <laughs> one day. One day. We're gonna have one day. It's gonna be a part of my future streams. <laughs> so yes, uh, thank you very much everyone who tuned in from the start and, you know, mid from the middle, who tuned out eventually. I'm just really, really thankful people are here. This is like the first time I've had so many people in chat and I'm super, super thankful. But my throat is about to go. <laughs> in 10 minutes, this would be a 3-hour stream and that's the longest I've been on. You enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, Val. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is... I might do this again in the future with more research. And maybe more throat lozenges. I enjoyed myself so much too for today. So I think I'll never stop saying this, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone who was here. But I'll catch you on my usual video game bullshit streams, maybe. My internet is starting to go. I'm sensing some delay again in the force. So. I'm gonna end this here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Daghang salamat. Arigat thanks gozai much. I'm Maya Maya Magandar, mermaid VTuber in the Philippines, folklore nerd, and see you next time. Thank you again. Thank you very, very much. Goodbye. Maya Maya muli. Paalam. Bye bye. Bye.